This is now chapter 19. Uh, before we do 19, can yeah. we, I didn't understand what the um, Board of Governors is. Chapter 19? Oh, questions on the 18 homework? Sorry. Yeah. I didn't really understand what that was. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't have to. Yeah, we didn't have to. Yeah. Um, two, two, seven, and eight. What did I ask you guys to do? Two, seven, eight. All right. What is the major purpose of the Federal Reserve System? What's this job? Well, I got to regulate U.S. money supply. Regulate U.S. money supply. Okay. So, what's the next one? The Board of Governors. What is the major responsibility of the Board of Governors and the Federal Open Market Committee? What's the Federal Open Market Committee? Did you guys look that one up? They're the ones that uh, control the selling of the bonds and stuff like that. Exactly. So the Federal Open Market Committee is what buys and sells the, the government bonds. And the Board of Governors is what tells the Federal Open Market Committee how much to buy and sell. Oh. So when the Board of Governors get together, their job is basically to say, okay, guys, how much money do we want to add or take out of each area? And then it's the Open Market Committee's job to do that. What do you mean by area? Well, each bank is, so each, the 12 branch banks and the 27 sub-branches, they actually monitor the money supply in their region, not just the whole country. So it could be that San Francisco has a glut of money right now. It's got lots of money in the system. But if you look at Denver, it doesn't. And so in Denver, they may try to increase the money supply, whereas in San Francisco, they may actually try to decrease the money supply. I don't know. They may have a lot more in Denver now that they... <laughs> it, again, they're keeping track of it relatively closely, depending on the, the different economies, but that's their job, right? So, so it's to take care of the money supply, and then it's the Board of Governors that dictates how to do it, and it's the Open Market Committee that actually does it. I had a friend who worked at the Federal Open Market Committee for like three years, spent 50 to 60 hours a week minimum buying and selling government securities. How oh, fun? Oh, God. It's crazy. She was going to go. I thought she was going to go insane for a while. Because, I mean, she never worked less than a 50-hour week, ever, and was constantly trying to figure out where to buy and sell you know, government securities based on the amount that they were supposed to in any given week. That sounds like fun. So you have to actually go out and find buyers. Yeah, uh huh. Or sellers, whichever one. Whatever. Yeah, uh huh. It was just so. So she constantly calling up banks, saying, "Do you guys have any government securities you want to sell?" Or calling up people like Warren Buffett and saying, "Hey, Warren, you know, you're sitting on a billion dollars in government securities." Don't. don't. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, th th that kind of a concept, right? Calling. Calling big, huge uh, management firms for for four hundred one ks and retirement accounts and saying, "Hey, you guys have so many U.S. securities in it. Do you want more or less? How much? Can we bargain?" Right? And again, their job was to keep the U.S. banking system solved. Cool stuff. All right. So Federal Open Market Committee is great. Great. If you ever get a chance to work for them or intern with them, wow, go for it. But you're ready. It's a hard job. It's fun, and you'd love it. All right, so we go with the other ones. How about number eight? Because I thought they were already operating as an independent bank. Right. Uh huh. So, but it's your choice. Do you think it should be taken over by the federal government instead? No. So just. It's your opinion. Okay. Tell me what your opinion is. Like I said, give me two sentences. As long as you give me two sentences, you you're find not going to answer. Your opinion. <laughs> Alright, so the goal then of the Fed is to make money. How do you think they make money? With a 3D printer. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh -oh. <laughs> 
Uh, okay, trade flat loss by partial um, deposit bank. All right, so first off, what do I mean by make money? I was okay, just going to ask that. There's a difference between making money and earning money. Right. Banks earn money by charging interest when they loan it out to people. That's what, that's what allows them to earn money, right? That's profit. But there's something else that banks do, and it's, 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 it's magic. Banks are wizards. They walk around every 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 month when when a, a local bank gets together and has its its you know sort of monthly report to the to the Fed. All the bank presidents have to get together. They have to wear those wizard robes, you know, with the stars and the moons on them, oh. and they have to wear the little pointy hat mm -hmm. and carry a wand. And then they do a pagan ritual, and we magically have more money. Exactly, that's how it happens. There's a ritual. They all dance around and sing. There has to be a cauldron with boiling water. Right, that's chapter 19. What's 20? <laughs> <laughs> all right. So the magic words that banks use are fractional. Reserve banking. So these are the magic words that they chant every time that they make money appear out of nowhere. Now, it, it'll sound a little corny, but once you see it happening, you'll be kind of like, whoa. Because it's one of those things that once you see it, you're just like, whoa. Because it happens, and it's happening all the time. So, look at my bank account. Never goes up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So let's imagine that Kedrick is walking around with a thousand dollars in cash. Because that's the kind of kind of guy he is. Right? He's a gambler. Not seriously, but he might be. For the week. So he decides that he is a little nervous walking around with his $1,000 in cash because he knows when he goes to his econ class that he's, you know, it's just really easy to lose it there. His teacher's going to show him that. <laughs> so he deposits the $1,000 into the bank. Now, The question then is, well, what does the bank do with the $1,000? Now, it's our conceptual idea that the bank takes the $1,000 that we gave them, and they go back to their vault in the back of the bank, right? And they... Yeah, we saw that happen on, you know, gun smoke a hundred thousand <laughs> times. Put the $1,000 in, close the door, and that's where your money's going to sit, right, Kendrick? Forever, until you go and pick it up, right? No, of course not. I mean, what does the bank do with the $1,000? Well, what the bank does is that it has to do this fractional reserve banking, right? So, so after they take your $1,000, they get out their magic wand, they, they wave it over the money, and they say, fractional reserve banking. And it disappears. And what happens is your money <laughs> turns into two piles of money. One is required reserves, the other <coughs> turns into excess reserves. This, these two piles of money, Hold on. sorry. Is it both a thousand bucks? Nope. The money's getting split up into these two pots. So they put 500 here, 500 there? Not even, less than that. They only put 100 here. They put the rest over there. What, what the Fed decides is how much this number has to be as a percentage of that. So the fractional reserve banking, that's the Fed telling banks that you have to hold 10% of your money in required reserves. 
which basically says, Kedrick, that when, they, when you give them $1,000, they take 100 of it and put it in the fund. The other 900 of it, they throw it in a big, huge pool where they swim around in it at night when they, they're done with work. And they're done taking their... And they go burn it. <laughs> well, what do they get? What do, what do banks want to do with that extra nine hundred dollars? Well, they want to loan it out. They want to loan it out because when they loan it out, what can they do? Charge. charge interest. Interest. They can charge money. interest. They can earn money on the nine hundred dollars. That's the earning part of it, right? But now here's the tricky part of it, right? So they can't lend out the whole thousand. Nope, they can't. Nope, they can only lend out ninety percent. Now, the key here is, suppose that right after Kedrick deposits his $1,000, Keanu rolls into the bank. They bank in the same banks, it turns out. And Keanu, how much money do you need? Guess how much I think you need. $1,000. She needs 900 bucks because that's how much the bank has available to loan. Excess reserves, folks, this is loanable money. Whenever the bank has excess reserves, they can loan it out to someone and earn interest on it. Right? <laughs> Remember that they're paying interest on Kedrick's $1,000. Right? So they're going to have to charge that much more on top of it in order to earn money on the side. Now, the scary part here is that Keanu walks into the bank and says, I need 900 bucks. The bank looks at Keanu and says, Keanu, you're good for the money. No problem. Here's $900, and they, they go over to Kedrick's pile of $1,000, pull the 900 bucks off on the top of it, and give it to Keanu. As soon as that happens, the bank has created magic. Why? Because they still have $1,000. Kedrick, how much money do you have in your checking account? $1,000. Plus interest. Potentially. <laughs> Now, all of a sudden, Kiana has $900. How much cash do you have, Kiana? 900 bucks. How much do they have together? 1900 How much money is really there? 1000 1000 But now, all of a sudden, there's 1900 They just made money out of nothing. Right? And what's Kiana going to do with that 900 bucks? Well, she's going to say, well, well, you know, I need to go out and buy uh, another leather jacket because I need a black one. See? <laughs> so she I goes to the bucks. store, finds the, not, the, the leather jacket that she wants, but the, le the, the leather company says, you know, if you take out a credit card, we'll give you 10% you know, off on this leather jacket. And Kiana's like, oh, okay. Instead of paying cash for it, she's going to put her credit card on. So what are you going to do with that $900, Kiana? Put the bank pay off the credit card. <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna put it back in the bank so you don't spend it on a nice pair of leather pants. Is what you're gonna do, <laughs> right? So she puts the nine hundred dollars back in the bank. What's the bank gonna do with that nine hundred dollars that Canada just gave them? She's gonna keep Blowing ninety bucks of it. Put they're gonna put uh, ninety of it over here, yeah. and they're gonna have eight hundred and ten of it over here. What, Shannon? How much money do you need? $810. She needs $810 because you need a new TV. Turns out it's an $810 TV. So you walk into Best Buy, and you're going to buy that in cash, but Best Buy says, you know what? We'll give you 10% off if you take out a credit card. So what does Shannon do? Puts the credit card back. Gets out a credit card, takes the $800, puts it back in the bank. What does the bank do? Same thing all over again. Same thing over and over again. Every time you put money in the bank, what does that bank do? Hocus pocus. More money made in the money in the money supply. This is how banks create money out of nothing. Using fractional reserve banking. And this is why everyone assumes that our monetary system is just a big huge Ponzi scheme. Because all that money that was being created, the $900, the $810, the $720, all of that stuff, it's all getting made by magic because it's his. If he would have just held on to his money, this wouldn't have happened. Then he couldn't come to class. He would take it. <laughs> but this is how it works, right? Is that banks always get to take their money and then loan it up. They'll always get it back, folks. They'll always get it back, right? I mean, that's the way it works. That's the way banking works. 
The idea is that very rarely do we walk around with thousands of dollars of cash in our pocket, right? So as soon as we get the cash, what do we do with it? We give it to a bank, and the bank says, oh, excellent. <laughs> Let me multiply those numbers out, all right? Now, it works the other way, too. I mean, what happens, say, day after tomorrow, after, after Shannon gets her TV, Kedrick says, well, crap, I need that $1,000 back because he needs to go out and buy, you know, what do you need? Thousand bucks. New, okay, well, I don't know about a new one, but <laughs> he needs a new vehicle, and he's going to go spend a thousand dollars on it, right? Probably just you know some used motorcycle. Let's I see motorcycle we got. Okay. So he goes back to the bank. He pulls a thousand dollars out. Did the bank go and hit Ket, you know, Kiana up for the money that she... They can't give him the no. imaginary money. They can't give him an imaginary money, right? Yeah. So the problem with it, right, is that the Fed, or that the bank now has to find $1,000 of excess reserves somewhere else, right? As long as they've got it, they can sort of give it back to Kedrick. Well, they have to be able to give it back to Kedrick. But what happens when the $1,000 leaves the system? What happens to the amount of money that they have to hold? Well, he's getting that back. He's getting this back. I mean, they go back to the 100 and pull it out. But then they have to pull 900 from somewhere else. Well, right? they take it from that. Well, but they've already loaned this out to Keanu. Right? So they got to have the 900 somewhere else, right? So it's a bit of a game. This is what banks have to do on a daily basis, is keep track of all this crap happening all the time and making sure that, one, they have enough reserves to be 10% of all of their deposits, and if somebody like Kedrick or me walk into the bank and say, I want my however much money I have in the bank out, they have enough money to give it to us. These are the banks that, these are the rules and the games that banks have to play with on a regular basis. So it, it's tricky. This is why banks tend to make a lot of money, right? Is that this is a tough game to play, right? But if you're smart and you know how to play the game, then you make money, right? This is why bankers are tricky, sneaky, and smart. They can play around with this Well, I stuff. can see how they can always have a, you know, figure in the black. You know, they couldn't have one in the red because it wouldn't work. Right. Well, I mean, again, remember they have to have all of these reserves from all these other different deposits, right? So, Kedrick's not the only person who's depositing money in the bank, right? Right. Right. So, there's other people putting their money in the bank. So, whenever they need to pull up, he needs right. $1,000. They pull this $100 out. They'll pull the $900 out somewhere else, but then wait for somebody else to deposit money in the right. bank. To replenish those reserves. The only way it's going to fall apart is if the biggest depositor comes in and says, uh, <laughs> Guess what, guys? I want all my money back right now. We only got 10% of other people. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> They're going to be like, oh, We got to shut the door. Sorry. That's true. All right, so the Fed sets the percent that banks are required. To reserve. This percentage, it generally, folks, it is sitting around 10%, right? This is actually relatively true. Um, depending on the size of the bank, some banks required reserve ratio is a little bit less than 10%. Smaller banks, a little bit more scary banks, banks that aren't as good of condition, who aren't as quite as solvent, their required reserve ratio is a little bit higher than 10%. This is the RRR, or the RRR, the required reserve ratio. And the Fed is what tells every bank what, that per what their percent is. Most banks, it's around 10%. Like I said, there's a few banks where it's down to 9 8%. Those are very, 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 very big banks who have very, very good numbers. When a bank, you know, I don't know if you guys have seen it lately in the last couple of years, but do you know how the paper has been grading banks or getting the grades for banks from the Fed? And some banks are graded A, some banks are, banks are graded B, C, and D. The worse your bank is graded, the higher your required reserve ratio is. But for the most part, it hovers around 10%. Now, the cool thing about it is that when Kedrick deposited his $1,000 into the bank, and Kiana made $900 appear. Shannon made $810 appear. 
I went out and borrowed $720. Each time we, we, we made another round inside of here, the money supply kept growing. We need to keep adding those numbers up and up and up and up. The cool thing about it is that this number, if you add them all up, this is going to be the uh, excess reserves. And you should be ready for this sort of a thing because we've seen it before. To see how much the money supply is going to go, grow, we're going to have a money multiplier, just like we had a spending multiplier and a taxing multiplier. The growth in the money supply from every deposit that occurs will always be the amount of excess reserves created times whatever the money multiplier is. Nice little cool tidbit. When the R equals 10%, the money multiplier equals 10. It's always just 1 over the required reserve ratio. 1 over 0.1 is 10. So in this case, when Kedrick deposited his $900, he will create potentially $9,000 in the money supply because of all the loaning of money that, as, the, as it floats through the system, right? Each time it goes through, it keeps adding more and more and more and more and more and more and more. Just like the whole spending multiplier created more and more spending, same sort of concept. So, interest rates. We'll get there. If Vince deposits um, so there are three questions I can ask you after every deposit occurs or withdrawal, one of the two. And just like with the spending multiplier, I will always give you what the required reserve ratio is and tell you what the, the money multiplier is right afterwards. So you will, don't have to calculate it. I mean, I'll always give it to you. But there are three questions I can ask you when a deposit or withdrawal occurs. <clears throat> One thing I can ask is what happens to required reserves? I can ask you what happens to excess reserves. And then I can ask you what could happen to the money supply. So these are the three standard questions that you will be asked whenever there is some sort of a banking event that occurs. Okay. So for this particular example, Vint, who of course is always walking around with large sums of cash, right Vint? Yeah. <laughs> or maybe it was a check. I mean, you know, whatever. Somebody paying you for your services. You're worth 100 grand a month, right? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so he's got $100,000. He goes to the bank. He deposits his $100,000 check. What happens to that bank's required reserves? Goes up by 10% of the 100,000. Exactly. So, goes up, and what is 10% of 100,000? 10,000. $10,000. Good. I do expect you guys to be able to take 10% of a number. Okay? If you need a calculator, that's fine. But I would like to think you could do it without it. What happened to that bank's excess reserves? Went up by 90,000. 10% of the, or 90%. Yeah, exactly. Remember that required reserves and excess reserves always have to add up to your amount. Your amount, right? That's what it divides up into. Could happen. What could happen to the money supply? Could go up. It will. It has a chance to go up. And go by up. how much? Ten times. A million. Nine, well, Base it off nine, of the, nine, the nine, excess nine, reserves, nine, right? So the money supply could grow by up to 
$900,000. Now, why do I only say up to? Because he said you can't go more than that. You can't go more than that. that. That's for sure. Could it go less than that? Yes. Why? If somebody decides that they want to stick it under their mattress. Exactly. Right. So realize that part of this tracking of the money supply is a little bit scary because you know, while Kiana was good and spent her money, and so was Shannon, and so was I, but if Dwayne came along and took out, you know, 90% of this number and decided not to spend it, or not to put it in a bank and just walk around with his pocket, struck for a while. I gotta ask. I just gotta ask. Okay. I mean, are, do the banks have the ability to take that excess reserve money imaginary money uh -huh. and use it for investment. Yeah. That's not right. That's not right. Well, the way they've done it, though, I mean, again, it, the, the way they've done it, though, is that they... It's like saying, I'm going to take nothing. Uh -huh. I'm going to tell you, you know, pay me, you know, 5% on this. Nothing that I have. Right. And... You know, I'm, yeah. that's where the money went under the mattress. Yeah, uh -huh. the way that the way that the banks did it, though, realize that technically they're not supposed to be able to invest it. They're technically only supposed to be able to lend it. But what the bankers did was they came they came up with this concept of a debt swap. And so what they were doing amongst themselves was saying, oh hey, you know, suppose Kedrick is running a bank and I'm running a bank, and Kedrick is saying, well, you know, I've got five hundred thousand dollars in loans. And I have $500,000 in excess <laughs> reserves. What I'll say is, hey, Kedrick, I'll give you $500,000 for your $500,000 in loans. And he'll say, great, I'll do that for you. But instead of actually giving me the loans, he'll give me an insurance slip that's worth the $500,000 instead of giving me the loans. And then I immediately take that insurance slip, sell all of the loans, and now I've essentially invested the $500,000 instead of lending it in a, in a backwards method. All right, so you, you realize the interest earnings immediately. Yep. And so you could say to Kedrick, all right, look, if you'll do this for me, I'll give you 5% you know, of the earnings, interest earnings, blah, blah, blah. And the banks did do that. Yeah, but they were, very, the they were very sneaky about it, though. They did it in, in the most legal way possible. I don't know whether it was really legal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, don't know about, I don't know enough about the banking right. laws that our government has created, but yeah. technically everything that they did was legal. Now, it was completely unethical. I mean, from an ethical standpoint, it was absolutely awful, but it was legal. It's just... Weird. I mean, you should only be allowed to whatever, whatever you've collected already, maybe on your loans. You know, like like somebody has a thirty-year mortgage and they've been paid for ten years. Banks wouldn't make enough now money. That, to, they, banks wouldn't make enough money to operate. I know they wouldn't. It, it wouldn't be worth it. That we wouldn't have a banking system, which maybe is a good thing. But it sounds to me like I want to be a bank. Oh, the hell yeah! And I, I want to, you know, keep my own money and say I'm going to make more money. Well, yeah, I mean, but you got to come up with, you know, a, a trillion so dollars in equity in order to do to create a bank. I mean, you have to minimum amount to create a bank is like a billion dollars in equity. So you need, it, it, I mean, that's to belong to the Fed. Oh no, just to be a banking institution. Period. You just Period. You need about a billion. Yeah. I mean, you I can do it smaller. Well, I got, I got, you know, I got ten million dollars here. How about taking out a loan from me? Well, no, you, well it, that, that has to be straight equity, right? So if you can find 100 people who have $10 million, you're in. Then me. And that's what a lot of banks do, is that they will get 5, 10, 15 people who are sitting on 15 to $20 million each, and they all pool their money together and say, fine, let's start back. And that, that's not uncommon. That's how community banks start. Mm -hmm. And credit unions. More credit unions. More credit unions than banks, yeah. But, I mean, that's the way the most, most banks have started. So realize that this is, these are the types of questions I can ask. Please remember that the excess reserves are the loanable amounts of money. So I could use that terminology instead. Is when Vince deposits $100,000, how much of that money can the bank lend out to someone else? 90. 
the excess reserves amount. Right. All right. So that is how banks work magic. Now, the book spends a fair amount of time talking about, you know, accounting and worrying about credits and debits and stuff like that on the, please don't worry about that, okay? It's, it's interesting and, and I, I certainly recommend you reading a, about it, but these are the sorts of things that I want you to be able to give me information about when purchases are made. Now, realize that when Vince deposits this $100,000, the reason that that $100,000 wasn't new money is that the $100,000 is coming out of someone's checking account, right? Since, since it was a check that was written to you. That means that that $100,000 is already in the money supply, okay? So the reason that the initial deposit doesn't count towards the money supply is that it's already in there. Right? The same with Kedrick when he put his $1,000 in cash in the bank. The cash is already counted. Right? It only makes a difference when it gets to excess reserves that it makes, starts to make new money or magic money or imaginary money, really. Okay? Now, there is a side note to this. Suppose the Fed buys... Uh, one million dollars of securities from a bank. Right, so suppose my friend, she got on the phone and she called First National Bank and said, hey guys, I need a million dollars in, you know, government bonds. Can you sell them to me? And they turn around and say, sure, no problem. And so they, you know, do all the, the appropriate computer work so that a million dollars transfers into the bank, and the bank transfers a million dollars in securities to the Fed through the Federal Open Market Committee's operations. Now, when that bank gets that a million dollars, where was that a million dollars prior to the bank getting it? Already in the bank. Who had it? The bank. The Fed. First National. The Fed. The Fed. The First National had the securities, right? They had the government bonds. Were they counting those government bonds as part of the money supply? No. No, right? Because remember, that, that government securities are not a part of the money supply. So, as soon as the bank sells those securities and gets a, one, a million dollars in, in essentially cash, what happens to the money supply? Shrinks sure, by a million dollars. Well, it goes up, actually. Yeah. Or goes up. Goes up by a million dollars, right? Now, when the Fed is creating this million dollars, where does that a million dollars go? Does the Fed, is the Fed depositing that a million dollars? Because no, remember, they were buying securities, right? So that a million dollars all goes into excess reserves. The first step of this, step one, one million dollars goes into banks' excess reserves. So does the money, like like you said, he's got a check for $100,000, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. all right? And, and that's written from a bank that mm -hmm. is essentially going to transfer that yep. 100000 into his bank. Yep. Into his bank. And even though part of the money that he gets is going to excess reserves or whatever, does the hundred thousand that that check is written from that other bank come out of the required reserve deposits? Ten percent of it will. The rest of it has to come out of their required reserves or their excess reserves. So whenever a bank has to dole money out, they will start by pulling it out of their required reserves first. The rest will come out of excess, which is why banks can't vary. So they early. really only take 10% of the money out of required. Out yes. of the required. Yes. They can't take all of it out of required reserves. They can't. Anytime a, anytime a bank ends the day without at least 10% required reserves in their required in their account, total deposits. Yeah, they, they, they hit a huge penalty from the Fed. Huge. I mean, 
huge even for Baker. So they can't. I mean, in theory they could, but at the end of the day, they would have to shuffle the money back and forth in order to make sure that it balanced out. Again, that, that's that's part of the bank's job, right? Is that when you go when when Vince pulls the hundred thousand dollars in, they know that they have to keep ten percent of it, and that other bank has to come up with the hundred thousand dollars, right? They have ten percent of it, but they don't. They have to pull the other ninety percent somewhere else. At the end of the day, that bank that that paid Vince hundred thousand bank Vince's bank hundred thousand, they have to make sure there's enough on each side of the the bar at the end of the night. Right. That's part of their job. So it's sort of like the check is only really worth ten thousand because they only are going to get well ten thousand really of the the unimaginated money. Well, yeah. I mean, if you think if you worry about imaginary and imaginary money, but yeah, they're you you spend them all just as easily. Well, yeah. I mean, I mean, think about it, right? I mean, when you when you buy stuff, what do we normally buy it with? Do we go out around with cash? No, we walk around the credit card, right? We swipe the credit card. How do we pay our credit card every month? Do we go to the check. credit card company and give them cash? No, no we write a transfer. check. How do we know whether that money that's coming out of our checking account is real or fake? Well, most money is not even seen nowadays. It doesn't, it doesn't, I mean, it's yeah. all done electronic exactly. funds transfer. So, so it doesn't matter what's real and what isn't. It's so, all real, period. Yeah, but before, I guess, that 1980, whatever. True. It, it was... was Probably a much harder game to play. Oh yeah, it was certainly. That's why interest rates were also a lot higher. Now, with this game being a lot easier, banks don't need to earn as much money on interest. They can make most of it by playing this game. Yeah, Monopoly. Yeah, basically. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So our first step here is one million dollars goes into the excess reserves. Therefore, um, how much can the money supply grow? Ninety or nine hundred million. No, it's the Fed, so it would be one million. Because it all goes into excess reserves. It all went into excess reserves, so we made it. We, we added a million dollars. How much more can it grow on top of that? Oh. Uh, to ten. Mm -hmm. <laughs> one million times to ten, ten million bucks. And this is what the this is what the Fed's doing, right? Every day when they're when they're you know they were I guess calling my friends saying buy and sell securities. This is what they were trying to do. They were trying to manipulate the system so that if they bought a million dollars here, they knew it was going to the money supply would grow quickly by a million, but they also knew there was going to be unintended consequences, right? Because the bank, as soon as it gets a million dollars, it's going to start lending some of it out, playing the debt swap game with some of it, and more money would be created, right? So the Fed has to constantly be balancing this. Tough game to play. Again, this is why you make the big bucks if you work there. She was making three hundred fifty, four hundred fifty thousand dollars a year to work for the FOMC. Why does she work there? Man? She worked a minimum of fifty hours a week. <laughs> she retired. <laughs> she probably did. <laughs> work three years. I'm gonna retire now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, mean, she, I think she was only there for five years. Yeah. It's not. It's not a kind of job you go and stay at a lot. Okay. Well, it's so kind of stress. I'm sure. So, uh, um, <coughs> if. The Fed sells, let's say, uh, five million dollars in securities to a bank. Now, remember, here the Fed was buying it, right? So the Fed was saying, "Here's a million dollars for your securities." What's it doing this time? Paying them. Paying them. It's taking money from them. It's taking money from the bank and giving them securities. Which are not in the money supply. Which are not in the money supply. So what's the Fed doing in this banking situation right here? Shrinking the money supply. Yes. Here, step one is that $5 million exits the money supply. So the bank has to pull $5 million out of its excess reserves to buy that $5 million worth of government securities from the Fed. Again, the idea here is that this bank had lots of excess cash sitting around, and they didn't want to just leave it, because if you have money that's just sitting on your mattress... Somebody might want to, somebody might try to take it. Somebody might try and take it, but more along the lines, you're not earning any interest, right? 
So the least you could do with that $5 million, if you know, Kedrick and I and Kiana don't come in and borrow the money, which they can earn lots of interest on, because we all have really crap credit, they could buy securities that they earn some money. Exactly. That's why they'll take that $5 million in cash and buy securities, because at least then they earn 1% or 2% on the money instead of nothing. Okay? So, again, banks try to have as little excess reserves at the end of every day. And if they see they're going to wind up with millions of dollars in excess reserves, they're, they're calling the Fed, saying, hey, guys, do you need to, to you know, to sell some securities because we got excess cash. Of course, banks don't call the Fed first. They actually call each other first. Because banks can charge other banks higher interest rates than they can earn on government securities. It's only a last resort that a bank likes to call the Fed. We'll get there. Though. All right, so step one, $5 million exits the money supply from their excess reserves. What happens, what could potentially happen to the money supply? Uh huh. Money supply could fall by up to fifty million dollars because the ten multiplies the five million just as much, right? Because now that five million dollars cannot cycle through the economy, and you basically cut it off. All right. And again, Fed has to play this game, time in and time out. This, oh man, <laughs> this, is, I, this, this was, I uh, could see you getting excited if it was your 50 million, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> well, this is, this was right after I finished my uh, undergraduate degree, so I was, I was just in graduate school for math at the time, so I was living on like $8,000 a year, I mean, I was poor, and so this, this woman, like yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This woman had finished her degree a couple of years before me, and so she'd been in the Fed for a couple of years, and you know, we would send emails back and forth. I'd say, what'd you guys do this week? And she's like, I can't tell you. I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> she, could, she couldn't tell me anything that she did until it had, 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 they did it two weeks ago. So she used to give me, what did we do two weeks ago? So it was like, we, two weeks ago, this is what we did. And it was like, I bought, you know, $20 million of securities from this bank, and I sold $40 million of securities to that bank, and oh, blah, blah, blah. It was, it was and now I'm going to go drink. Yeah. <laughs> That's what she was doing, too. Oh, boy. It, well, yeah, let's leave that one. Um, so, <laughs> so the, this, is, the, this is one of the big powers that the Fed has, is the buying and selling of government securities. All right? Now, what else can the Fed do to uh, muck with the money supply? Again, whenever I write M2, that's me saying money supply. So the first, these are the first two pieces, right? These are the small, minute ways that the Fed can adjust the money supply. When the Fed is ch changing the money supply by only millions of dollars, that's, you know, that, that's small, right? You, you guys know how much money is in the money supply? A lot. <laughs> you guys looked up how much cash was out there, right? Yeah. yeah. So that's how much money is in the money supply. That's how much cash is in the money supply. Remember, that's only a piece of what M2 is. I think there's like... Oh, yeah. At least ten times as much. Well, more than that. <laughs> yeah, there's like there's like you know twenty five thirty trillion dollars worth of, of M two floating around out there, folks. Right. So when the, the Fed's playing with millions of dollars, it's nothing, right? That that's like you and I playing around with pennies, nickels, and dimes, right? Fed million dollars, it's like us playing dime poker, right? So what else can the Fed do? Uh, the next strongest method is to play <laughs> with interest rates. So the Fed does have the ability to play around with interest rates to some degree. Blah, 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 not skipping anything. Okay, nothing yet. Okay. Thank you. 
Have you, guys, have you guys ever heard the phrase, the discount window? Not something you've heard, okay. So the discount rate So imagine, if you will, at the end of the day, the bank president is looking at his reports and he says, hey, we're you know, four or five million dollars short of having our required reserves. Well, in order for the bank to officially close without taking huge penalties, they gotta come up with that money. Got it. Otherwise, they're screwed. So how do banks get required reserves when they can't find a, a sucker like me or Kadu Kirkiana to come in and deposit our money in there? They ask the Fed. That's absolutely right. So what the Fed will do in the discount window is it will lend money to banks for one day. So if me as a bank president, I'm $4 million short for the day, I call up the Fed, my Fed, my regional Fed bank, and I say, look, I need $4 million in reserves. What does the Fed say? Sure. 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 No problem. Pay me back tomorrow, though. Pay me back tomorrow. Absolutely. Right? So $4 million, the Fed sends them $4 million through electronic transfer. And that bank, when they borrow money, though, what do they got to do? Pay interest. Pay interest. The discount rate, that's the interest that the banks pay the Fed. The Fed's a bank, folks. It's a private bank. They have the ability to earn money. This is how they do it. Every day, every bank in the banking system has to make sure they have enough required reserves. If they don't have enough, they call the Fed, and the Fed says, well, Kendrick, your bank is okay, we'll do it. Now, what happens if Kiana's bank calls me and says, hey, we need $2 million in required reserves, and the Fed looks at its books and says, well, you guys no. are always borrowing money. Yeah, no, we won't lend you any more money. What does the bank do? Sells a bunch of securities. <laughs> it, it calls another bank. Because the first place to go is the Fed, because the Fed charges you interest, but usually it's very, very, very small. If the Fed won't do it, the banks will. The banks will. So one of the other classic banking terms that you'll hear is called the federal funds rate. And this is the same thing as the discount rate, except between, instead of being between a bank and the Fed, it's between a bank and a bank. When a bank confusing. charges another bank to borrow required reserves. And again, when they borrow this money, folks, they borrow it for 24 hours, one day. Where do they... Where does the bank loaning the money come up with that money? It has to be in their required. It has to be in their excess reserves. If they don't have the excess reserves, when Kian's bank calls, they say we don't have that money in our excess reserves. Tough shit. And that, then that bank calls another one. So they they aren't they aren't taking it from the required reserves nope. because that wouldn't make sense at all. Yeah. Nope. Nope. It has to come from another bank's excess reserves. But it's for the bank that's borrowing it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Take it out of our imaginary. Take it out of their imaginary money pile so that we can put it in my real money pile, money in pile, theory, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> it's interesting. All right, so these things So what does lowering the discount rate do? So if the Fed says that to borrow money from me, it'll cost you 3% interest, and they lower it down to, say, 2% interest. What are they trying to do? What's the Fed trying to do? Exactly. They're trying to increase the money supply. When the Fed is lowering the discount rate, they're trying to make it easier for banks to borrow money from them so that they can lend it to people like us. All right? So this discount rate, back in 2007, 2008, we're sitting at somewhere around six, six and a half percent. Guess what it's done over the last five years? Down. Plummeted, right? 
it has fallen a ton. Right now, the discount rate is sitting at something like a half a percent. Why? Because the Fed is desperately trying to convince banks to lend you guys money. So hurry up, Kevin. Go buy that car. Which is what they did when they tried to sell everybody houses. Yeah, same thing. With the mortgage rate. Yeah. Well, mortgage rates are tied to the discount rate, for the most part. That's what I was wondering. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're not directly tied to it, but for the most part, I mean, again, think about it like this, right? The bank needs to earn some money off of interest, right? If they can borrow from the bank, from the Fed, at a half a percent, and Vince wants to buy a, a $500,000 house and pay 4% interest, what's the bank earning in the process? Well, three and a half percent interest, right? So they're like, okay. If all of a sudden the Fed raises that rate to like two or three percent, what's happening to that bank's profits? It's going down, so the mortgage rate's going up. Yep. But how do they, uh, I thought the banks have control of what they charge in interest rates? Yep. Is that what you're saying? To us, yes. Mm -hmm. To us. Mm -hmm. They don't have any control over what the Fed sets it at, but. They, they have control over how much they'll sell it to us. Now, there's other factors tied to it, but this is one of them, right? Mm -hmm. So, lowering the discount rate will increase the money supply. Again, how much will it increase the money supply? Eh. Hard to judge, right? But we know that it will increase the money supply because it's making, easy, making it easier for banks to lend money, and that's what makes the money supply grow. It's the banks creating more fake money. As long as they're willing to do it, perfect. The system will keep propagating and producing more money. So if, if the Fed raises the discount rate, what happens? The money supply will decrease, so just keep those two straight. Okay? So the last thing the Fed could play around with, there's one other thing that they play with, right? So the, the three main tools the Fed has, one, buying and selling securities, two, adjusting the discount rate, and then three, and three is the nuclear bomb of, of, of money supply messing, is something we've already discussed a little bit, is the required reserve ratio. When a bank changes, or when the Fed changes that required reserve ratio, that makes the largest difference on the money supply. Now, back in 2008, when the banks were all failing, and it looked like most of the banks in our system were going to go underwater, basically, what the Fed did in order to try and shore up the banking industry was they changed the required reserve ratio for every bank. They raised it. So it used to be that the, the required reserve ratio hovered around 8 to 10 percent. The Fed rose, every, rose the required reserve ratio by about 1 percent on every bank. When they did that, folks, I almost left the country. Because the Fed has never changed the required reserve ratio more than 1 percent, except for one other time. Guess when that last other time the Fed changed the required reserve ratio? The Depression. The Depression. Right? The two times that the Fed has changed the required reserve ratio were during the Great Depression and the Great Recession. What they did here was to try and stop us from freaking out about the banking industry. They said, we're going to start regulating banks more so that you guys will quit freaking out. But when they raised this required reserve ratio, forced banks to hold more money, what did the banking industry do? Increase their interest rate. They clenched their butt cheeks so tight, folks, they wouldn't lend a dime to anybody. Right? They also paid less interest on your deposits. Oh, yeah, exactly, right? Because they were hurt, Lower right? Lower interest rate. They were, they were having a hard time coming up with cash because the Fed had stepped in and said, you know, when Kiana, when Kiana comes in and deposits her $4,000 paycheck she gets every two weeks, <laughs> you got to hold more of it than you used to. And the banks were like, oh, crap, you know? 
Now we're going to have to borrow more money from the Fed. Yes, exactly. Now their, their bottom lines looked worse and worse and worse. And so to counterbalance that raising of the required reserve ratio, that's why they lowered the discount rate so much. So when the Fed lends them money to meet that required reserve ratio mm -hmm. at the end of the day, mm -hmm. and they're collecting interest on that loan, mm -hmm. is that taking money out of the money supply? Technically, yeah. I mean, a little bit, but it's... Only five percent. But I'm, I'm saying it's not because it's going to the Fed. Is why? Yeah. Because it's not securities. No. Mm -mm. It's a very, very minute amount, though. Again, remember they're only lending it for one day. So the amount of interest, even on ten million dollars, the amount of interest at 05 percent for one day right. is like ten grand. Which just, it, it's like, it doesn't seem like the Fed is really a banking system. Huh? I mean, they, because they, they're not increasing the money supply by their earning of interest. Right, no, well, you know but earn, again, making money and earning money are two separate sides of the coin. Right, yeah. totally yeah. separate. Yeah. Right, so when, when banks are making money, they're not earning, right? Right. They can if what they do when they make money is to, like, cleverly invest it. Is there some specific amount of money that the Fed, like, the banks have? Do they have to have their 10%? Yeah. I mean, the banks have to have the 10% Not with the, the banks, Fed. The on Fed. Oh, the Fed itself? The Fed itself. I mean, it's a bank, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, is there like a specific requirement? Yeah, all of these, all of these things apply to them, yeah. All these rules apply to them. So they have to have, in theory, 10%. Of course, the Fed has the right to make, print money, so anytime they don't have enough, they can just I was going to say, how do they borrow it? Who do they, they borrow it from? They, they just make it, literally. Well, that's where the magic comes from. <laughs> that, that's a little bit of where the magic comes from. But realize that the Fed, folks, is a nonprofit corporation. Any any income that the Fed earns from, from charging interest, it actually goes into the Treasury. The U.S. Treasury. So it well, actually goes to the government. Yeah, it goes to the government. They give it back to the government. Which is kind of cool if you think about it. It lowers yeah. our taxes every year, the Fed does. Okay, so again, the three tools that the Fed has to work with to play with the money supply. The biggest is setting this required reserve ratio, right? It, when you see this change, if it changes by more than a percent, run. And the, just, just run. Canada's a nice, safe place. It, right? Everybody doesn't, nobody locks their door in Canada, right? It might you be a little bit colder. Right? Yeah, true, it'll be colder. It'll be snowy. It's going to drop a nuke there. Stay two ways. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, <clears throat> this, the discount rate, this is the, 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 the Fed's next smallest tool. Right? This changes rarely, right? It, it usually changes like once every six months. Now, in extenuating circumstances like it has been the last two or three years, it's changed a little bit more often than that, but usually the Fed doesn't change the discount rate more than once every three to six months. And usually the, the move is you know, a quarter of a percent here, a half a percent there. It's completely messed up right now. But, and then the last thing that they do, and these are the fine tunings, right? A lot of this is often done to rotate money from one area to another, right? So again, it, it's slightly used to balance the overall money supply in the, in the overall United States, but mostly it's to say, well, there's too much money in San Francisco, not enough in Denver, let's even them out a little bit. Or there's not enough to in New York and too much in Chicago, let's balance them out a little bit, that kind of business. Right. This is the fine tooth comb. But you should know what will increase the money supply, right? Buying securities or lowering either of these two rates. That will increase the money supply. Buying securities or raising either of these two <coughs> rates will increase the money supply. Pretty straightforward if you just narrow it down to that much. Alright? And that's really all there is to chapter 19. But raising and lowering the federal funds rate wouldn't do anything to the money supply? Well, the, technically, the, the Fed doesn't have control of that. That's what banks charge other banks. But, I mean, it wouldn't increase or decrease because that money is still in the supply. It's just switching well, hands. It is, yeah. 
Yeah, you're right. I mean, for the most part, it won't make a difference. Again, though, when this rate goes down, though, then banks are more likely to call up other banks and say, hey, you know, I've got a sucker. I mean, I've got a person here who wants to borrow money, and I need $100,000 to lend to them, and I don't have it in my excess reserves. Can I borrow it from you so that I can lend it to them? I'll pay you a half a percent interest, and I'll charge them 8%. So technically, as soon as they give that person $100,000, what are they going to do with that $100,000? They're going to spend it. And what's going to happen to that $100,000 after they spend it? It's going to go into somebody's bank. Guess what? Increase the money. Increase the money supply. Start the churning system. So it, do, it doesn't initially change the money supply, but as soon as that lent money starts getting spent and hits the banking system again, Mm -hmm. All right, so chapter 19, a little bit of homework, 2, 8, and 10. Page 425. So what we're going to do next class, when's the next class? Wednesdays? Today? Wednesdays? Mm -hmm. yeah. We will learn how playing with the money supply actually affects the economy. So right now we've talked about how the money supply can go up or down, but the question is, how does that make it I mean, So what if the Fed can increase or decrease the money supply? What does that do? We haven't really figured that out. Mm -hmm. To some degree, yes. I mean, Giving people money so they can spend it helps. But what's the unintended consequences behind this? Or what are the real consequences behind this that you will see? Alright, so Wednesday, chapter 20. The quiz will be over chapters 18 and 19. So be ready. Because we haven't quizzed over 18 yet, have we? No. Thank you. 